Amen, amen. Thank you again for your kindness, your generosity to this ministry, and I guarantee you it's, it is sown into very good ground. Amen. Well, listen, this morning I was dealing over the last two weeks about this message. Uh, in my heart, in my mind, and I know with many Christians, the day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior is a very special time. We don't necessarily celebrate a particular day, but we celebrate an event that took place over 2,000 years ago with over 500 different witnesses that Jesus Christ was alive. And you may have noticed if you're a student of the Word of God that He didn't go show Himself to Pilate or Herod or anybody else. But he showed himself to the faithful. And I got news for you this morning. He will still show himself to the faithful. Oh, amen. I tell you, it's more than just a day. But it is a life-changing experience. Understanding about the resurrection of our Lord. So as I was laboring over this message for the last two or three weeks... Of course, one of the things we always try to do, and I know some pastors don't, but I do, and Pastor Rodney does, and some of the others, is over a title. You know, could you imagine selling a book that didn't have a title? Well, it's a book. <laughs> but as I began to fret over this, I remember, not the message, but the title, that I heard over 15 years ago. When the Lord spoke to me, and I thought, well, if it's good enough for me, it's got to be good enough for you. Amen. And it was simply titled, Don't Miss the Resurrection. Don't Miss the Resurrection. And as I heard this title of this message come out, I didn't have any, I don't even remember what the preacher talked about. I was too busy living a life that was self-directed by my flesh. And see, what sinners do is they always kind of procrastinate this event that's going to take place, and that's a thing called death. And as all sinners, and I was chief of sinners, I guarantee you, this body to me was an amusement park. Oh, yeah. And this amusement park was used to satisfy my flesh with drugs, with alcohol. I wanted to go to parties. I wanted to go to bars. I wanted to gamble. I wanted to go to casinos. I had my eyes on the opposite sex. And it was more of a lifestyle of amusement and when I went to that service finally and there was a lady at a bar that I frequent some of you may have heard of at the scotch and sirloin uh, I put so much money into that place you could call the left wing after hash burger <laughs> smoked them expensive cigars drank that tequila drank that Johnny Walker black Oh, I was living high. I knew who all of the buckies were. They would give me small envelopes, and I'd give them big envelopes. <laughs> oh, yeah. The devil knows how to steal from us. But a lady that was there was a woman that went to an assembly of God. And she had been talking to me for years. And at times, I would sit there with my cigar lit, and I was a businessman, making plenty of money, tipped extremely well, so they would always give me their ear. And I was about half tight. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You know, you're not slobbering drunk, but you still have a mind where you can kind of talk with not having too many words slurred. And she came up to me and began to talk about the Lord. And I have an extensive background with my relationship with this God. 
And I was familiar with many of the scriptures. And as she began to talk to me, let me tell you what, God will go anywhere the sinner is. Because he loves the lost. That's why he gave his life. And I began to talk with her about the Bible. And as I talked with her, tears streamed down from my eyes. Because I was lonesome for a relationship with my master. I was far removed from him and living a life that I thought would satisfy. No matter how much I drank, no matter how many drunk, no matter lines of cocaine, nothing ever satisfied because as soon as the high was gone, the remorse was always there. The money was always gone. I almost lost my beautiful wife. Because, see, I didn't care about other people. All I cared about was myself. You see, sin is a selfish spirit. And it wants its own when it wants it. But she invited me again to the Easter meeting. So I went. I don't know why. I look back now, I know why. Because the Holy Spirit pushed me in that direction. And I went. And I heard that preacher Declare the title, Don't Miss the Resurrection. And something hit me with such a force. Never remembered any of the message. And the next day, when I went into my bathroom to begin my routine of my day, God Almighty showed up. He said, as he knocked, I opened and he came in and he grabbed every power of darkness by the throat and pulled them to the side. And then he began to speak to me. Won't you come home, son? I've got something prepared for you that's so good. that I broke down and the burden that I had been carrying for so long was removed immediately is I gave my life back to the Lord. Because I knew I didn't want to miss the resurrection. Because I understood a little bit about what the Lord was talking about. And as I begin the message this morning, I want to bring you back to a scene where Jesus Christ had been told by His friends that Martha and Mary... Their brother was very ill, very sick. And they told him, you need to come right now. But instead, he did not come. He lingered. Because why? The Father told him not to go yet. And I'm going to tell you, as a born-again believer, baptized with the Holy Ghost, you better be led by the Spirit of God. You don't get ahead of God and you don't get behind God because He has a perfect appointment for each and every one of us. And the Lord tarried. And then finally, He began to head towards where Martha and Mary and Lazarus was. By the time He had got there, Lazarus had been dead for four days. And they began to weep and let Him know that if only you would have been here earlier, Jesus, you could have saved His life. Here in John 11, in verse 25, <laughs> Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Listen to this, it's very important. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Then he asked this question, and I ask you this question this morning. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Heavenly Father, once again, as we enter into your presence, as I stand behind this sacred desk, Father is your servant. In and of my own ability, Lord, I have nothing to offer these people. 
But Father, through the unction and the power of the Holy Spirit, as I step aside, you have a word for them this day. A word of revelation, a word of resurrection, a word of life. And I'm praying again, Father, for the Holy Spirit to move upon the hearts of each and every one. You are the only one. You are the living God that can deal with those things that are hidden deep within the heart, Father. You have the, oh God, you have the ability to manifest them. And I thank you this morning once again. And Satan, I take authority over you by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that you will not hinder this word in any way. And Father, once again, I pray that your word will go out unaltered and it will, Father, be delivered to the hearts of each and every one. And I pray, Lord, that they will have ears to hear what the Spirit has to say this morning. And Father, I ask it all in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Many of you this morning are going to hear a message that you're familiar with. Some of you are going to be reminded, but some of you are going to hear something you've never heard before. And I pray that you give full attention to what it is that God has for you. You're not here by accident this morning. You may think that it was your decision to come here, but I guarantee you it was by divine appointment of the Holy Spirit. We didn't come out here to talk about chocolate bunnies. We didn't come out here to talk about color and Boiled eggs, I don't need buying color to eat them or to hide them. We didn't come out here to talk about decorative baskets to go choose. And as I look around the congregation, I'm glad I don't see any because I don't want to offend anybody. We're not here to talk about beautiful Easter bonnets for the ladies to wear. It used to be a really big event. Everybody would go out and get them a new bonnet. So they come to church so everybody could see. And the guy behind couldn't see. <laughs> but we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And his resurrection was a, listen to this very closely, a consummation and proof of God's prophetic plan to save mankind succeeded. Oh my. In Matthew 17. 22 and 23. And while they abode in Galilee. Jesus said unto them. He imparted. Some revelation knowledge to them. He said the son of man. Understand that that's a very important. Legal identification. Of who Jesus Christ is. The son of man. Shall be portrayed into the hands of men. And they shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorrow. Well why were they exceedingly sorrowful? Because they didn't understand number one. Why Christ came. Why he was called the son of man. And we're going to delve into that some more so you can have a better understanding. John 5.25 says this. Verily, verily. And I want to tell you something about that term. Verily, verily. Jesus Christ is the only one that ever began a sentence with verily, verily. Go and check it out. And when he said verily, verily, what it meant was in the Greek, means amen you know that's a lot of times when i'm preaching somebody gets a little on fire to hear something they agree with they'll shout amen but it's okay in this church to go amen when you hear truth say amen he says i say unto you in the Greek, it means I am the amen. Truth itself. I tell you as a most certain and infallible truth. This is what he's saying. You see, when you study the word of God, if you don't study in depth and understand what the Greek is really trying to bring out, you'll miss what the Holy Spirit is trying to relate to you. 
Now, here's what it is he was saying to them. He said, the hour is coming and now is. Listen to this very closely. When the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. It's very important to hear that. That's another legal identification of who Jesus Christ is. You know, sometimes it's difficult to understand. But you see, Jesus is all man and he is all God. He is the God man. But when he came to earth, he did not function as God. He did not use his deity. But he did not resign from being deity. But when he came, he came to be a representative of man. He said, the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they who hear shall live. He's not talking about those that are in the grave. Yet though there's a dichotomy there, there's a double meaning there. You know, when Jesus Christ come up to that grave where Lazarus was inside, he said, Lazarus, come forth. The reason he said his name, if he had just said come forth, they'd all come forth. <laughs> and that will happen on the day of the first resurrection. The first resurrection is when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth, which is very shortly. Very, very shortly. If you're not looking for him, you're blind. If you can't see the temperament of this world and the evil, even in our own nation, the power of darkness that is spreading over this country. A president that's never been attacked like anybody else in that office. The Lord is about to return. And the dead in Christ, those that have gone before us by the way of the grave, they shall rise first. And then those which are alive and remain, that's when the Lord will speak your name. Each and every one of us will hear our name. He will say, Jim! Come hither. Oh, hallelujah. There's a lot of naysayers out there, but I'm telling you as I stand here today, that voice shall sound and the church will depart. And the only ones that are going to be left here are the ones that's rejected him. A lot of backslidden preachers are going to come home and begin to preach the truth. But those that hear, he's talking about those that are dead in their sins. If you don't know Jesus Christ this morning as your Savior and your Lord, you are dead in your sins. You know, when I was backslidden, I didn't believe Jesus was my Savior. You know why? Because of the type of life I was living. And if I'd have died in that state... I'd have went to a devil's hell. And then one day I would have stood at the great white throne of Jesus Christ for judgment to defend why I rejected him. And I would have been cast into the lake of fire. Some of you may think, well, man, that's awful. That's awful rude of God. That's awful cruel. Well, we're going to get into it. And when you leave here, you're going to find out it's not. But he said, if the... The dead will hear what the Son of God has to say. You see, the Word of God, and I, I want to bring this out. Some people think that this book right here was just written by men, and oh, there's errors in it. There's things that, that are conflicting in it and all that. I got news for you. If there is, then there is no God. If God can't keep His Word infallible and written exactly the way He wants it, then He's not God. And I'll guarantee you, He's a God that created this universe. He is able to keep His Word perfect in these last days so we'll know truth. 
And if you don't know the Word of God, you don't know revealed truth. You don't understand what it is that God wants you to know. But I'm going to tell you this morning, 15 years ago, God said, i got a work for you to do. And who had ever thought that somebody that was backslidden four times I was in, I was out, I was in, I was out. You know, when I started serving God, they had this revolving door for me. <laughs> but why would God choose somebody like me to teach a Christian how to live for Him? That's up to God, but I guarantee you, He showed me how to live for Him. It's 15 years this month that I've been serving the living God. And victory, victory! Bondages are gone. Desires of the world are gone. And the love for my Redeemer has been birthed in my heart like I've never known it before. But I want to tell you something about this word. It took 40 guys that the Lord used to write down His word over 1,500 years to write it. And this, again, is the only revealed truth given unto man that God spoke. And I would caution you that you might want to hear what it has to say. That's why he called preachers to let you know what it says. So later on, you can read it for yourself. Let me tell you about creation. You know, I don't know what it is, but our school system, and I know what's going on. The devil's right in the midst of it. Kick God out. Now you've got to put a metal detector in there to make sure kids ain't carrying guns. They can't carry a Bible, but they can carry a lot of other things. They can hand out condoms, but you can't hand out a Bible. You want to know why our teens are so messed up? Why our educational system is so upside down? Teacher ever say anything about God, they'll be fired. But they can teach them how Muslims pray. No matter how hard man tries to explain away God as the creator, they're always stumped by one question. It's a checkmate and reveals their ignorance. And even a child knows how to stump them. Well, where did that come from? Where did that come from? Well, how? Well, it just came from where? You see, they don't have the answer. But if they look in Genesis 1-1, they'll find out exactly where it came from. In the beginning, God. You know why they don't want to believe in a creator? Because if they believe in a creator, they've got to believe in a God. If they believe in a God, they better find out what it is that He wants. That's why they don't want to believe in a creator. Because if there is a creator, maybe we ought to teach about it in our schools. That's why they keep bringing up all this nonsense about half monkey, half man. There is some of those around. They're all up in Washington. <laughs> Thought I'd get an amen there. Oh, thank you very much. In Hebrews 11.3, you know, here's the thing. If you've got a question, look here and you'll find the answer to it. Hebrews 11.3 says... Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. Now listen. So that things which are seen were not made of things which appear. So what God did, He created the universe out of nothing. That's God. You know, the problem is that man doesn't understand that God is an eternal individual. That there is nothing hidden from Him. He's always been here. And He will always be here. God created man in the only wisdom that God could create. Now I want you to think about this because it's very important for you to understand this. He gave man a free will to choose life or death. Now think about this a minute. How would you create a man? Well, I wouldn't create one where I had to send him to hell. Oh, well, how would you create him? Would you create him where he would just love you? Now, I'm going to challenge that wisdom. If you create a man that is forced to love you, 
That right there is a forced relationship with God. If I force someone to have intimacy with me, the court calls that rape. And that is not love. That is violence. So when God created man, he created him in a way where he would have a free will to choose God based on the merits of God. That's the only way it could be. So when he created man with a free will, God told Adam simply, don't do this. I've got all this for you. Don't do that. If you do it, you will die. Here's what God demanded. His faith to believe that he will always tell you the truth. That's all he asked of Adam. Nothing else. Didn't ask him to jump through hoops. Didn't ask him to say the alphabet backwards. None of that. He just simply said, you got to believe me. And God gave Adam free will to choose life or death. And life comes by faith. Death comes by unbelief. That's the simplicity. That's it. You wonder why you're here? God wants to give you life. But he gives you a free will, a choice to choose life, death. Life, death. It's that simple. Now understand something. When Adam violated the law of God, what he was saying, God, you're a liar. When you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're calling God a liar. I don't need you to have life. And that's the way the world is today. That's why the Lord said, straight as a gate, narrows the way, and few there be that enter therein. God gave Adam a free will. Adam chose death. In the loins of Adam was the human race. I've heard many people, and I've got myself in trouble. I've had people leave the church over this. They had a new little baby, and I told them, I just like this little baby right here. I said, you, I don't know whether you know it or not, but that's a beautiful little sinner. <laughs> you don't believe me? Give it a couple of years. <laughs> you don't have to teach them how to lie. You don't have to teach them how to covet. You don't have to teach them how to steal. You don't have to teach them how to tear stuff up. You don't have to teach them how to be jealous. You don't have to teach them how to throw a fit to get something they want. That's because that it is its nature. Because it's an offspring of Adam. Now, the child is innocent. If for some reason that that child passed away, it would go right to heaven. Until that person reaches an age of accountability where it understands God does not require of them what they don't have. So understand that. And that's why the Lord said to raise up your children in the way of the Lord and they will not depart from it. So it's up to the parents. And that's the reason so many teenagers today are so rotten and all they're doing is looking at their phone all day. Because they haven't been brought up in the way of the Lord. That's the reason there's so many suicides. That's the reason there's so many teens out there that are in sin. And parents, I'm going to guarantee you this stuff starts at 12 and 13, 14 years old. When it used to take a whole lot longer today. When Adam didn't believe God. He died. 1 Corinthians 15.22. See if you want to know the answer. It's in the book. Now I'm going to tell you where it is. 1 Corinthians 15.22. It says for in Adam all die. You see only God could explain this to you. See when you are born into this world. You are born after the likeness and the image of Adam. Adam can only produce that which is dominated by the power of sin. So, God had to come up with a solution to this. And let me tell you something about God. He doesn't go along and go, oh man, we should have thought of that. You know, why didn't God just start over? Adam, I'm done with you. I'm going to start again. If he did, he would have shown and he didn't have foreknowledge. That he made a mistake when he made Adam. But he did not make a mistake when he made Adam. You see? 
God is a planner. And he planned. Oh, yes. You see, God created a perfect universe and God created a perfect man. God created man where on an individual basis each could be, listen to this, recreated. This is the reason that the Lord told Nicodemus. And you can find this in John 3.3. 3. See, if you want the answer, God has it all right here in this book. He said, Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. Now, see, the Lord was explaining to him, there's a problem in the state that you're in right now. Because in you, if you are in Adam, there is sin residing in you. Now, here's the thing. God didn't say, okay, I hold you responsible for the condition you were born in. No, he does not. He does not blame man for being born into sin. As a matter of fact, he made a plan a long, long time ago. You see, God created man with such love, but with a foreknowledge and a plan that was designed before creation. How do you know that, Pastor Jim? Well, I looked in the book. And you know what God told me in the book? If you want the answer, it's in the book. You won't find it sitting on a couch. Listen to a psychiatrist. He ain't got no answers. He needs a redeemer. Then he changed professions. First Peter 1 and 18. Listen to this. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed, huh, the Bible says you've got to be redeemed. Hmm. With corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation. In the Greek, that means your life, the life you were living. Received by traditions from your fathers. But with the precious blood of Christ. Listen. Why does it say the precious blood of Christ? In the book, it says life is in the blood. If you don't believe me, cut your wrist and watch the life fade away. That's where the life is. It's in the blood. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, listen to this, who verily, amen, was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last days for you. You see, before God created the universe, before He created the angels, Lucifer being one of them that turned and committed high treason against His Creator, before man was ever created, before any of the physical aspects of this universe was created, the high council of God had a plan. They were all in a perfect agreement. They all knew their part they were going to play, what the Father was going to do what the Holy Spirit was going to do, and what the Son was going to do. They all come into perfect agreement. Now, why God created man, only God knows. Because He sure created a bundle of trouble. But I think one of the reasons that God created us is so we could have life. You see, when God originally created man, He created us after His likeness and after His image. So we were perfect. We were holy. He was without sin. So they had a perfect plan. You see, God knew exactly what Adam was going to do. He knew exactly what that sleazeball Lucifer was going to do. And that he was going to be the father of all lies. And I'll guarantee you, while you're listening to this message, Satan is whispering to you, you can't give your life to the Lord. You've got too much amusement to do. Oh, you better hear it. I'll tell you what. I know what he's saying to you. Just hold on here a minute. And you, he'll, he'll, he'll turn up the volume here in just a little bit. You better hear what I'm saying. But see, the Holy Spirit's going to turn up his volume too. Amen. God loves man so much, he became a man to represent a replacement of Adam. 
Mm -mm -mm. You see, Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, why did Christ have to die for us? Number one, he had to pay the sin debt of Adam and all of humanity that is encumbered by that sin debt. See, you, don't, you can't pay it. How are you going to pay it? What are you going to pay it with? You're going to live a good life? I'm going to tell you right now, everybody was so sad. Now, I don't want you to get offended at me. I know some will. It was kind of funny during the Holy Week, as they call it. And the Notre Dame Cathedral burned down. And I watched that tower as it began to fall over and crashed into it. And they said, oh, that was thing that was raised up to the glory of God. No, it wasn't. It was raised up to the glory of man. 800 years ago, they were killing people for reading the Bible. About the time that thing was built. And I thought to myself, a thing that was considered such an icon for religion. Everybody was heartbroken. Oh, this great cathedral that represented... No, it represented man's glory. It represented religion. It represented death. It represented a doctrine that has sent literally hundreds and millions of souls to hell. If you think you can live in sin and God will deal with it and it's okay because you eat a cookie and drink a little wine and you confess your sins to a man, I got another. Oh, I got the word here that says no. There's only one person that can intercede for man and it is Jesus Christ and he alone. He is the one sitting at the side of the Father and the Holy Spirit is the vicar of Jesus Christ on planet Earth. Ooh. So when I seen that thing begin to burn up during the Holy Week, I thought, God, surely you wouldn't do that, would you? <laughs> you see, this is not a religion, people. This is not a religion. This is a living God that created a man. And he knew that man was going to fall. And everybody that was born was going to come out of the loins of Adam. You go back. You know, I guess if they do that DNA test you can buy. Ask them if it'll take you all the way back to Adam. If not, ask your money back. <laughs> That's so dumb. You know, here's the thing. You can do a DNA test on me all you want, and it'll never show that I'm a child of the living God, and I'm an offspring of Jesus Christ. Had to have the sin debt paid. The next thing is to be the new fountainhead of life to all who will believe. That's why the Lord said you had to be born again. We're going to find out a little more about that. If you're not born again and you're just religious, well, I've been baptized in water. Well, if you're not born again, you just come up a wet sinner. Also, this is most important. He gave his life on Calvary to be our righteousness. For God demands absolute righteousness. God doesn't grade man on a curve. Well, if you're this good, you can make it. But if you're this good, you lose out. No. It had to be absolute perfect. Why? Let me tell you something. Could you imagine a universe where gravity worked just some of the time? I go in there and look at my refrigerator and it's up on the ceiling. <laughs> We've got to put some more food in there, honey. You see, you look at God's universe that was created absolutely perfect. Everything runs absolutely the way it's supposed to be. When I look out on the eastern horizon, the sun comes up every single morning. Well, see, you, you Christians are really kind of stupid. You see, the sun ain't coming up. The earth is turning. Listen, dummy, when I look out there, the sun's coming up. I don't care what you call it. 
I know the earth's turning. God made it that way. Can you imagine the earth turns, the moon goes around the earth, and the earth goes around the sun, and our galaxy goes around in the universe. And there are hundreds and billions of galaxies out there. And God made all these stars, and he said, I call them by name. That's our God. He loves man so much he came to earth and become a man to die, to create a way for us to be absolutely perfect and righteous. I am perfect. I am righteous. I am holy because I'm in Jesus Christ. And when the Lord looks at me, he don't see me. Oh, hell of a Sunday, he sees my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Oh, if you don't get excited about that, you ain't born again. I know where I was, and I know where I'm headed. Amen. You know why? Because I read the book. You see, I got the authority on it. And God never lies. He can't lie. He's not like a man. You want to see something lies, just look towards Washington. Every time you turn around, there's a new one. My, my, my. Let me tell you something. Now, here's something a lot of religious people don't like, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Well, how can a God of love ever send anybody to hell? Because you don't know the book. Number one, what you're saying is a fallacy. God never sends anybody to hell. What you've got to understand about God and what you've got to understand about sin. Sin is a matter of imperfection. God cannot accept any imperfection. It would violate who He is. He can't and He won't. God's love will never ever override His demand for absolute righteousness. For it would violate who He is. Understand this. Every soul that's in the belly of this earth right now in hell. Number one, they're isolated. They have no company. They are facing the decision they made upon this earth. And they will be there until hell is resurrected in the second resurrection of death. That's when they will all stand before Christ. To try to vindicate themselves before a living redeemer that has scars in his hands and in his feet. And the spear that stuck him in the side and say, I did it for you. Why did you reject me? Why did you turn me away? What was it that was more important than your soul? What will a man give in exchange for their soul? Satan hates man, and he fills them full of lies and deceit. Let me tell you something. You better understand this, what I'm getting ready to tell you. God will continue. He's a God of love. He will continue to deal with you. He will try to draw you. He will keep bringing you, come to me, come to me. But only God knows when you said no for the last time. Only God. You think, well, later on I'll say yes. I got news for you. There are people that said no and didn't know it was the last time they would ever say no to God because God knew that they would never say yes. God has all foreknowledge. But He gives man every opportunity over and over and over and over. He says His grace has appeared unto all men. You see, I know that because the Word of God says it. And when that day comes, you said no for the last time. Then it's a time for God to schedule, which He already has. Your death to bring about the greatest good. And let me tell you, understand something. If you know the Word of God, it says that God has no pleasure, none whatsoever, in the death of a sinner. He gave His life for the sinner. He gave His life that we might have life. Now, here's man's dilemma. It's a, now, see, when you talk about a dilemma... It's a difficult choice that has to be made between two alternatives. But it has to be made. 
of which there is no escape. You have to make a decision. And here's the decision that you have to make. Choose life. Choose death. You got to choose one or the other. You know, I've listened to a, a friend of mine who was an attorney. Well, I'm kind of agnostic. I don't not believe, but I don't believe. You know what? You can't play games in the court of God. When you don't choose life, by default, you have chosen death. Understand that. You reject Christ, you accept death. And when that takes place, understand. Hell is the only outcome because God can't allow you in heaven. Because you will defile the holy ground that Jesus Christ has established for his saints. So it's not God. Don't blame God for what is in hell. But here's the beauty. I guess it's beauty. Maybe a, a revelation. God loves every single one of those in hell. Now here's something to blow your mind. God even loves Hitler of the horrible things and atrocities that he did because he was a man that needed a savior. Every man that's born on this planet needs a savior. Every one of them. And everybody gets the opportunity to choose or reject it. Again, you can continue using your body as an amusement park or you can turn it over to God to be a temple of the most holy God where he wants to reside on the inside of you and give you life where he can open up your heart and your mind to see things that you're blind. You know, let me tell you something. If you're dead in your sins, the only voice you can hear is that of Jesus Christ. Do you understand me? And it's Jesus speaking to hearts this morning. You see, I can go up to a dead person and say, listen, would you like to go have a cheeseburger? I'm not going to get a reply. Well, would you like to take a ride in my Camaro? But when Jesus Christ says, rise, he will get up and he will begin to live. He will begin to walk. And that's what the Lord is speaking to sinners in this house this morning. He said, will you hear my voice? You see, Jesus is knocking. That's what he's doing. Let me in. Please let me in. And I will sup with you. I will show you things that you do not know right now. I will reveal myself in a way that you have never, ever understood. And I will give you life. I will give you peace. I will give you joy. I will direct your life. I will bring about the fullness that you have wanted in your life. And it will come through Christ and Christ alone. I want to read something before I get ready to close here. And I don't know if I pronounce her name right. Charlize Theron. Anybody ever heard of her? Anybody not heard of her? All right. Well, for those of you who haven't heard, she's a big shot in Hollywood. You know how it is, Hollywood. When I want some political advice, I, I call them up on the phone and say, Hey, what do you think about this Trump guy? Should I vote for him next time? Now, Hollywood is just full of wisdom and understanding. Let me tell you what this woman wrote. I just happened to go by it and I went, the Lord said, tell the people this. She said, I adopted a boy who at three told me she was a girl. What? I adopted a boy at three told me she was a girl. I'm going like, did you expect? inspect that kid before you like I want to make sure all the parts are there <laughs> listen to the stupidity of the world Jackson was assigned male at birth well I think she's talking about God but see now God's a liar because she's a girl now listen to this now, here's what this Charlize said. My mother told me when this life is over, you will have lived the truth you are comfortable with 
And nothing negative can come from that. You don't think that can come out of the pits of the heart of Satan? You got to live, you know, with what you believe is comfortable. And nothing negative can come out of that. I read that and I thought, you know, what? that is the epitome of absolute unadulterated ignorance of who God is. You know, religion is the killer of mankind and its philosophies. What it's really about is a thrice holy God. I want the musicians and singers to come back up, please, if you will. This relationship with God is about a thrice holy God who became a man that you can have life by being born again. You see, the beauty of when Christ died on the cross and he resurrected from the dead. Now God says, listen, if you will believe me, I will do a miracle. I will take you out of Adam and I will put you into Christ. And how do I know this? Because 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells me very plainly. He tells us that those that are in Christ are a new creation. And I, I want to read you something here real quick. You know, the Lord said, and I, I won't go to it, it's in Peter. He said, he has begotten us again. Begotten us again. You see, I've been begotten. No longer from Adam. But I've been begotten through Jesus Christ. What the Holy Spirit did, my soul. See, this is a miracle you can't see. And what happened? He gave me a brand new soul that is undefiled, recreated. And he put it in Christ. And now I am a child. I am an offspring of Jesus Christ. I just didn't turn over a new leaf. I just didn't decide to be good. I didn't decide to be faithful and honest. I don't cheat on my taxes anymore for several reasons. <laughs> uh, the monitors are really mean. But because I don't want to. I want everybody to stand to your feet. I appreciate you listening to me this morning. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The Holy Spirit has already told you. You don't want to miss the resurrection. Because if you don't hear what I'm saying this morning, and you reject this Savior. Now I'm going to give you the opportunity here in just a minute. If you reject this Jesus, you are saying, I want death. You're saying, I don't believe it. You're saying, I can do it later. You don't know what tomorrow holds for you. You don't know if you leave this church. Some 18-wheeler may run into the side of you and you're gone. And you go into judgment. The Lord said it's appointed unto man once to die. Then judgment. But you see, those of us that are born again, death has no power over me. I know this body one day if the Lord tarries is going to be put in the ground, which I don't really care. You can do whatever you want with it because I will be with Jesus Christ. He is going to give me, amen. He's going to give me a brand new body. Brand new. I want every head bowed. You've heard what the Holy Spirit had to say this morning. And you've understood. The Lord made it very plain. That in Christ all live. In Adam all die. It's a very simple thing. Very simple thing. I want life. The devil's telling you right now, you don't want to give up the life you're living now. If you, if you start going to a church, you're going to have to quit drinking, you're going to have to quit partying, you're going to have to quit doing all these great things you like. I got news for you. You give your life to the Lord. He will open up a life that is so full and so complete, so full, that you'll look at those things you used to do of how evil, how foolish, how senseless. There's no profit in it.
There's nothing to be gained out of it. I'm going to ask you this morning, as every head is bowed, Pastor, I'm in a mess. I'm in a mess. Lord, I need a Savior. Pastor, I need this God you're talking about. I need the reality of life. Because the life that I'm living now is not life. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's nothing there. One day just goes into another day. It's the same thing. Go to work. Get paid. Go out and party. If you're that one, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I want you to pray for me, Pastor. I want you to lift up that hand. Lift it up right now. Say, Pastor, I want you to see those hands. I see those hands. I know the devil doesn't want you to raise up those hands. He wants you to hold on to that seat as tight as you can. I'm telling you this morning, if you raise up your hand, God sees that heart. He knows exactly where you're at. Well, I've got too many family members here. I can't, I, I can't give my life to the Lord this morning. The Lord said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. And in that day, He'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. What is your lost soul? What is it worth this morning? I want to give you one more opportunity as the Holy Spirit continues to move this morning. I've seen those hands that were raised. You can put those hands down. I'm going to give you one last chance. Lord, if you want me to pray for you, I won't embarrass you. I want you to raise your hand up. Say, God, I need you. I need you, Lord. I need you. I want you to take one last step. Those that raised up their hands, I want you to come down here and let me pray for you. Every one of you that raised, come right now. Don't, don't hesitate. Come right now. Come. Come down here. Amen. Don't, if you raised up your hand, come down here. Come on. Come on down here. Come on. Rededicate your life unto the Lord. He wants you back. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. God, you know. You know these hearts, Lord. Amen. Amen. Just let Him love on you. Just let Him love on you. Oh, hallelujah. Let Him love on you. I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me now. I want every one of you to look at me up here, okay? This is not about joining a church. I know some of you are rededicating your life unto the Lord. I know how the enemy works on you. I know how he wants to destroy your life, how he wants to come in and try to direct you and discourage you. But I'm telling you this morning, we serve a living God, and he will not lie to you. If you give yourself and you believe this morning, the Lord will produce a new creation in you. I want all of you to look at me this Look, Everyone look at me this morning, okay? Look at me. Every one of you look at me. Listen. What you've done this morning, you have made a statement publicly. Lord, I want you. I don't want this world. I want you. Lord, I want you. Lord, I want you. You simply believe in your heart what I've been preaching this morning, that Jesus Christ, he died for you. If you were the only one to accept him, he would have still died for you. And I tell you this morning, it doesn't matter how far you've drifted. I walked away from God four times. And it took a while before finally God got it through my thick skull. How to live for him. He loves you. He will strengthen you. And all he's interested in today 
is you to believe that he is the son of God, that he died on Calvary, that he gave his life for you. He shed his perfect blood that you could have life. And if this morning, if you will believe it in your heart, and I want you just repeat the words that I'm going to say this morning. These words will not save you. These words are kind of a guide to help you know what to say. And I don't want your voices to be alone, so I want everybody out here. As a matter of fact, if you didn't come down here, you can say this prayer. If you really believe it in your heart, you can be born again. Now I want each one of you just to repeat these words, and I want the congregation to repeat them also. Dear God, I come to you now. I am lost. I have drifted. I am far from you. I repent. Mean that when you say it. I repent of the life that I've been living. And I want you to forgive me. I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to direct my life. I believe that you were raised up on that third day to life. And I receive right now that life that you gave upon Calvary. Amen. If you believe that this morning, God has restored you. Amen. He has given back to you. You are born again. What I would highly recommend to you, the most important decision you'll make as a Christian is where you go to church. The Lord said in these last days not to forsake the assembling of yourselves. If you forsake the assembling of yourselves, I'm going to tell you, there's powers of darkness out there that will drag you back out where you came from. That's why I come, not just because I'm the pastor. I need it just as bad as everybody else. You don't think the devil don't bang on my door? Every time I turn around, he's got a new suggestion. So I want you to continue coming out here. And I want to pray for you before we close this service. Heavenly Father, once again, I thank you for those that have come forward. Those that have asked, Lord, for you to do a work in their lives as only you are able to do. Father, I thank you on this day that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. There are those that have heard your voice and they have hearkened to what you have called them to do this morning to give their lives unto you. Father, I'm praying for the Holy Spirit to build a hedge about them. I pray, God, that you would birth in their heart the truth that can only come from you. I pray you strengthen them, keep them, Father. And Lord, once again, we thank you for what you have done this morning. For it is fruit that is bore unto your glory. And Father, once again, I ask it all in the blessed name of Jesus. And all the people said, be blessed this morning.